Hi, everyone. This is Erin from the DNA Learning Center. I'd like to welcome you here to my home. I am going to do a microscope lab with everyone today that has to do with Otzi the Iceman. Have you guys ever heard of Otzi the Iceman before? We have done other lessons that relate to Otzi, uh, so it's possible that you have discussed some of this information with us before, but I'll try to fill in some background information and then I'll show you how we can use microscopes to learn more about this unique story. So Otzi is the name of a natural mummy that was found in the Italian slash Otzo Alps. So he was actually found on a border region between Italy and Austria. And the body that was found when it was originally found, uh, the two people, the husband and wife that found this body up in the mountains, they just thought that it was, you know, an individual who had unfortunately died maybe while hiking. They had gone down to get uh, someone to help out. And as people tried to escape, excavate the body, they started to realize that maybe the body was a little bit older than they thought. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you right now. So let me pull up some pictures. Let's see, Share my screen. Can everybody see that? Let me make it bigger. Okay. All right. Let me see if I can even make it full screen. How's that look to everybody? All right, so this up here, this is the name Otzi that I've been saying. And this down here is the first picture that was taken of this mummy. And we call it a mummy because, well, if you've ever heard the word mummy before, what do you think of? I know for me, when I think about mummification, I usually think about Egyptian times. Um, and it's true that in that culture, people did take bodies and mummify them. A mummification is really a preservation of a body, which can be done um, by going through a very lengthy process, or it can happen naturally. Natural mummies are rare though, because typically when someone dies or even when any living thing dies, let's say it's a plant that dies or a mushroom that dies, what typically happens to that organism when it dies? Does it stay just as it is? No it will decompose or decay and go back into the earth, which is true of the human body as well. So for a body to be preserved naturally, we just don't see that very often. And what you see here in this picture, which is kind of an unusual picture, you have this individual kind of stuck in ice face down, but what makes this so interesting is that this discovery was of not only a natural mummy, which is incredible, but incredibly old natural mummy. So does anybody know how old this body really is? Let me turn the page for you here. So here's another picture. And you can see that they've gotten some of that ice away. So we see more of the body. Um, this body they eventually discovered was over 5,000 years old. That's incredible. Uh, to give you a little bit of perspective, remember when I said in the beginning that I usually think of Egyptians with mummification? Um, that time period where Egyptian culture was mummifying bodies and we think of the pyramids, that's um, an estimate of, let's say, 3,000 years ago. So this body is over 2,000 years older than that time frame. Absolutely amazing. So in your opinion, so we have this body here. Once they got the body out of the ice and they started to melt some of the other ice around the body away, they found a number of this individual's items. They found some of his stuff, um, which is exciting. In your opinion, why is it important and exciting to find someone who's so old and to find his possessions with him? What do you guys think? Well, there are so many answers to that question. Um, in my opinion, the reason I get so excited about this story is that I like to think about our past as humans. I like to, uh, to think about how we have changed 
and how in some ways maybe we're the same as people from long ago. And I like to learn about those aspects of our history. But if I'm interested in studying people from 5,000 years ago, how am I gonna do that? It's very difficult. Um, we are lucky if we ever find materials or objects from people from the past that can help us understand those cultures or those societies. Um, but to find an entire body that has been preserved and to have all his possessions, well, I shouldn't say all, uh, many of his possessions with him is exciting because it tells us a lot about the people of that time. Um, there are other factors to this story that make it interesting as well, and I'm going to go over some of those with you today. Let me show you another picture. Okay, so these are just some images of some of his possessions, some of the objects that he had with him, and it's not all of the objects he had. Um, you can imagine that he was wearing clothing when he died. Uh, he did have animal skin clothing um, and he had this, um, I guess it would be kind of like a, almost like just a sheet material or a blanket. They don't really fully understand what the function of that is. Maybe it was a cape, maybe it was something else. Um, his clothing was largely kind of decayed or pulled apart or just broken down, but it's incredible how much of it was preserved. Uh, if you look up here, these are actually his shoes. So we're able to see how he built shoes, how he put them together and how well constructed they really were. Down here, this picture is of a copper ax. So we know that he had a copper ax and we know a little bit about his culture from that as well. In our lab today, we are going to look at some information, some evidence that was inside his body. We're going to be looking at something called pollen. These are just some images that relate to pollen. Have you guys heard about pollen before? So me personally, I'm allergic to pollen. So pollen is a substance that is released from some plants and it relates to their reproduction has to do with how they reproduce or make more plants. Pollen is typically released in the spring. And I know it's, well, it's spring right here, right now where I am. I'm not sure because it is pretty early spring. I'm not sure if any pollen has been released, but I, I bet there's some out there right now. Uh, there are some time periods in the spring where there's more pollen released from plants than others. And I know I'll go out into uh, my driveway and my car will be covered by pollen. And it looks almost like um, a little bit of dust on the car. And if you take a look here, do you see this bee right here? This bee is covered in pollen. Um, and down here on this plant, um, what I suspect in this picture with the plant is that the wind is moving the plant and kind of shaking that pollen around. And these two pictures are great because they tell us some of the methods by which pollen is moved around. Bees can go into flowers, they can look for that nectar, and they can get pollen all over them, and they can move that pollen to another flower. Wind can move pollen around, humans and other animals can move pollen around. So pollen in the spring is always all over the place. It is definitely in the air. So I have a question for you guys. Do you think it's possible that you've ever inhaled or, or even ingested, eaten some pollen in your life? I guarantee you have, absolutely. Um, it's perfectly fine to ingest pollen or breathe it in. I just really don't like it because as I said, I have these allergies and it makes my eyes get all itchy. It makes my throat hurt a little. Um, so I'm not a big fan of it, but it is okay if you get some pollen in you and we all have. Look at these pictures over here now. You see these? So these are actually real pictures of pollen from different types of plants. So if we look at pollen from different species of plants, so let's say we look at pollen from oak trees and we compare that pollen to let's say pine trees, we'll see under the microscope that those pollen, they have different features or characteristics. So to you, do these look like the same type of pollen? To me, they do not. They have different characteristics. In fact, what do you think this one on top looks like? Does that look like anything familiar? Uh, it kind of looks like Mickey Mouse to me. You don't have to think that at all, but I kind of see this center region that looks like a face, and then I see these 
what look like ears to me. They look like ears. Um, and down here, if we're looking at this pollen, um, it looks basically like a circle. But do you see these indentations or these kind of nick marks? We have one, two, and three. So those are features that help us identify that pollen is belonging to a certain species as well. All right, let's see what else I have here. Now, I did not take this picture. This is just a picture of pollen grains that I thought I'd share with you guys because it gives us an appreciation of how diverse the characteristics of pollen can be. They really have so many different shapes and sizes, um, and it's an exciting thing to study pollen. I remember when I was in college, in the first few years of my college, I was studying plants and we had an opportunity to look at pollen grains under an electron microscope. And it was honestly one of the highlights of my school career at that time, because we got to see something so small in such a new and unique way. So what I'm gonna do with you here, although I don't have an electron microscope, I'm gonna share some pollen grains with you. And they relate to that guy, Otzi the Iceman that I was just talking about. Let's take a look, okay? So one of the things that they studied when they were studying this body is they wanted to know not only what was on the outside of his body, uh, let's say his clothes or the objects that he was carrying, they wanted to know about what was on the inside as well. Um, and we're just gonna be covering this one thing. There's other information that they found out by studying the inside of the body. But we're gonna be looking at the type of pollen that they found in his digestive tract. So like I said before, in the springtime, if you go outside, I guarantee you're gonna inhale or even ingest some pollen, just like Otzi the Iceman did. In fact, the fact that they found pollen in his digestive system um, is an indication that he died during the spring. Amazing. Uh, we will not only be looking to see if there's pollen, but we are interested in the type of pollen and the location in his digestive tract. So let me give you a little bit of information here. So this beautiful picture that I have here um, is of basically the digestive tract, which includes the stomach, the large intestine, and the small intestine. And I want you to imagine, let's say you eat something. So I've got, this is my beautiful drawing of a strawberry over here. Let's say you ingest some strawberries, you eat some strawberries, they go through your digestive system, they're getting broken down in different ways. They're gonna travel, 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 very long. And let me come over here now. Let's say I ate strawberries um, after dinner last night. And let's say when I woke up this morning, I had some blueberries. Here's my blueberry, okay. I just show you this and talk about this because would you agree that if I ate the strawberries earlier, so I ate the strawberries last night, that they would be farther down in my digestive tract? Whereas the blueberries, if I eat them more recently, they would be higher up in my digestive tract. So we're interested in location and it gives us information about timing. Well, eventually, okay, after you ingest this food, what are you gonna do? What your body is gonna do is expel it or you're gonna poop it out, right? Same thing goes with pollen. When you get pollen into your body, it is going to travel through your digestive system, but it's not gonna stay there forever. Eventually it will be expelled with the rest of the waste as well. So we're gonna look at the pollen or examples of the type of pollen that were found in Otzi's digestive system. So I have a very similar picture here. So this is the digestive system and I just have highlighted areas. So one, two, and three. And they're just targeting where we're looking at the pollen in his digestive system, excuse me. So one is just lower two is in the middle, and three is at the top. So three is going to be the pollen that was most recently inhaled or ingested by Otzi, and one is gonna be what has been in there the longest. The way that I'm gonna show you this, because pollen is really small stuff, is I'm going to show you using my microscope. I have my microscope attached to my computer, so let's see if I can share the images with you. All right, let's try this. I'm gonna come out of here. I may have to go back in for a second, so hold on. Okay, let me bring this up. All 
right, hopefully you guys can see that. I don't know if you can still see me in the corner there. I'm pulling my micro, this is my microscope, okay? It has a camera on top. So normally I put my eye to this piece and I look down through the microscope. But today to share it with you, I've put the microscope up top there and I'll be looking at the computer at that image. So this is something new for me, so it's very exciting. I have under here, well, I have different lenses or magnifications that I can look at. Uh, so I'm going to, just for our purposes, I'm gonna start on the lowest magnification and then we'll work our way up higher. Um, normally, if I have it on what we're seeing now, it's on a four times magnification. That's the magnification of the lens. And then typically the eyepiece has a 10 times magnification. <clears throat> So the way that I would um, use those numbers is I would take four, which is the lens, and I would multiply it by 10, which is the eyepiece. And that would mean typically what I was looking at was 40 times bigger than usual. So four times 10 is 40. I'm using this special camera before though, so it's possible that the magnification is a little bit different than it normally is. I'm not quite sure, um, but I just wanted you to give, get a reference of what we were looking at. So this is not very exciting. What we're looking on the screen, it looks like a bunch of dots because what I have to do is I have to focus in on this. So let's see how this works. All right, I'm using my focus knobs now. I can see that they're getting clearer, but it's still, it's really kind of small, right? What I'm looking at over here, do you see these little dots? Those are the pollen grains. Those are the pollen grains. They have been stained with a dye that's just kind of a magenta color. So the pollen is not typically that color, but we'll see that color just so it makes it easier for us to see them. I wanna make it bigger so we can look at those characteristics. So right now what you're seeing is I'm actually Flipping the lens, it needs a second to adjust. And what I'll need to do is I'm gonna to need to focus that one more time. After I change the magnification, I'm gonna always need to focus it. Oh, I see them coming in. Do you guys see that? Let's see, I'm gonna also try what you can do. And I recommend this whenever you're using microscopes is that I'd like you to kind of scan the slide that you're looking at. Don't just look at one spot. So I see some stuff right there. Can you see me moving it now? So I see here, some pollen right here. Here's another pollen. Uh, do you see that this one looks like it's upside down, which makes sense. You know, they're not going to all be right side up. They're scattered on this slide when it was made. And sometimes they might be folded or on top of each other. So it's normal to see a little variation in there. They don't all have to look perfect. Okay, okay let's scan again. See? Oh, that looks to be like some sort of fiber. Do you see that line? That's not really what we're looking at. That's just something maybe on the microscope. On the slide, I mean, those two are nice. Those two are nice. You see these right here? One, two, I'm gonna bring it up even further. Let's bring up that magnification. Let's give it a second to adjust. And again, I need to focus, okay? So bear with me here. And maybe I'm not going in the right direction. Let's go. This one's a little harder to focus in on. I'm gonna move my slide there, let's see. And I'll tell you, it can be very frustrating when you're trying to focus on the slides and try not to give up. I tell you that because I was getting frustrated there. Um, and that's normal, that's normal. Oh, look at that, look at that, looks great. Do you see that on the bottom over here? Everything moves faster when it's bigger. There we go. I'm gonna, oh, did you see that? Here we go, this is great, okay? That looks good. And I'm gonna maybe scoot it over. Remember, we wanna scan the slide a little. Let's see if I can come in. Oh, there's another one down there, oh. So I'm starting to see a similar pattern between these pollen grains here. I don't know if you guys are seeing that pattern as well, but it kind of looks like and I'll draw this in a minute. Look, it looks like a circle with like these two puffs on the outside. You see what I mean by that? So we got one puff, another puff. It's just kind of folded in that one. And then we've got this center area as well. Let's move over again. I want to find another one. Hopefully you can see what I'm talking about. Oh, there, that's a good one too. See that at the top? Puff, puff, and then that center piece. I'm gonna switch back to the lower magnification, just that medium magnification right now. And sometimes I like to do that. I like to go between them. Oh, 
Yeah, you see that? I'm seeing that, that pattern of these kind of two puffs over here and the center area. Would you guys agree with that? And overall, although they're not exactly the same, it does seem like these tend to seem to be the same type of pollen here. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. Okay, and I'm gonna go back into this one. All right, so that for us, that was slide number one. And I just, I took a picture before, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it bigger over here. I'm gonna place it down there in a second, but this is an example of having a lot of those pollen grains together. And what we're seeing is that kind of circular area that seems to have absorbed a lot of that dye. And then these puffs on the outside. Does this look like anything you guys have seen with me today? Does this look like anything? You remember those Mickey Mouse pollen we saw before? That's them, that's them. That type of pollen that has uh, those like puffs of air and they are actually air pockets. That's in fact why they don't absorb that stain or that dye, um, that's pine. That's from pine trees. If you guys know what pine trees are. In fact, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to write that so I don't forget that, pine. Okay, I like to take notes and if you guys are taking notes along with me, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. That's great, Let's see if I can grab this. Doesn't really want me to grab it. Okay, there we go. So that's pine down there. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna share slide two with you guys. All right. Okay, all I'm doing is just switching out my slide. That was slide one, moving on to slide two. And let's see where we go. Okay, can you guys see that? I didn't even have to adjust it. I didn't even have to focus it. I just changed the slide out and lucky me, <laughs> it looks pretty well focused right there. What do you guys think? It looks pretty awesome. Um, over here, I see something that looks like a big red area, um, almost like an oval shape. And then I see something that looks green and pink. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of colors. And I am seeing a bunch of shapes, but at this distance, at this magnification, I'm not really sure about that. So I'm gonna bring it up a little bit. Ooh, that's really cool. Do you guys see that? Let me see. I'm gonna try to focus on, oh, you can, ooh, that looks good. That looks good. What do you guys think about that? Look at that one down there. That's so beautiful. Does this look the same as what we saw before? It doesn't, it looks totally different. Even if it did have just a different color, that would not automatically be an indication that it was different um, because you could use different stains on different types of pollen, um, but you can see overall the characteristics are different. It's not just the color, right? Even up here, that one looks different. And I'm gonna kind of focus back and forth and keep, that almost looks like it has multiple layers in it, almost like kind of or little balls that are stuck together almost. You see when I come in and out, you can kind of see those dimensions a little bit more. That's cool right there. All right, I'm gonna scan this slide. Let's see if we find some other stuff. Oh, look at that blue thing right there. You guys see that? Oh, that's fun. That's cool. Love this stuff. Okay, I'm gonna scan again. Oh, wait, that's a big area. Whoa, look at all that stuff. Oh, that's that kind of like almost with those like little globular things stuck again. That's cool. Love that. And we can use our, our pollen key if we want to. We can go through and try to identify each of these. And I'm going to tell you a little secret about these pollen grains that we have here. Let's see if I'm, oh, look at that one. We haven't seen that before. Let's see what's over here. Oh, that's a cool little pink one. That's a different type of green one. I saw one before, look at those shapes. And that might just have a couple like uh, sitting on top of each other. Those look beautiful. Oh, what do you think that little Mickey Mouse one is? What do you guys think that one might be? That looks like some pine in there. So I have a question, does this all look like pine or does this look like a mix of something? Yeah, looks definitely like a mix. That one is cool, that green thing. I thought I saw something up I was gonna say, I thought I saw something spiky before. Do you see that? This one down here? That looks so cool. I'm gonna kind of focus it in and out. 
Oh, I love it. I love that one. Look at that. Awesome. So what we're looking at here, would you agree, is different than what we were looking at before, right? Different mix of pollen grains come out here. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, and I, I'm worried before I'm realizing maybe I wasn't sharing my screen with you. I hope I was before. Okay, this second one that we're looking at is a mix of plants. I'm going to try to just give you this picture here. Oh, that's a little stretched, a little funny. Let's put it over here. I'm just going to bring it over here so you can see it a little bit more easily. It's a mix of plants right there. Can you guys see me? I'm worried I'm not sharing my screen. Let me try that again. Hold on. I apologize if I wasn't sharing before or if I was just sharing and I turned it off. Sometimes it's hard to, oh, I feel like I'm sharing now. If I was not sharing before, I'm so sorry. Okay. You guys see this? So this is what I was just talking about over here. This is what we were just looking at. This was slide number two and it has a mix of plants. Um, these happen to be plants that grow in a valley region. Uh, so a valley is gonna be this lower uh, area um, in between two hills or mountains. These pollen grains represent plants that would grow in a valley region. And if I had messed up before, I'm so sorry. Um, and you didn't get to see what I was talking about. I'm so sorry. Um, this is what I was showing you before. These are the pine pollen. Okay, these are the pine. They were on slide number one. And I'm just gonna put that down. Oh, I didn't like when I did that. I'm gonna put that down there. That's our pine. And let me type in valley for these. I'm gonna say valley mix. New valley mix. Just drag that over. All right, now let's check out the third slide. Let's check it out. Switching it out. All right, let me try the share screen again. Seems to be my uh, my challenge today. Okay. Okay. So I just haven't focused. That's why it looks like that. Let's come back down. Okay. So this is slide three. I'm not even in focus really yet and I'm starting to notice something. What do you guys see? Does it look like the slide we just looked at? Does it look like that valley mix? What do you guys think? I don't think it looks like the valley mix. I do actually think it looks like something else though. Um, do you see our little Mickey Mouse pollen there? Do you remember what plant that was from? From pine trees. Okay, so it looks like we have pine again. And let's just scan the slide, like to do that. Oh, look, there's a whole big clump of them over there. Yeah, I mean, looks to me like pine. There is pine everywhere again. You guys agree? Let's write that in our notes. And let's see if I can do the share screen again. Yes, okay. All right, so this up here, number three, was actually that pine again. This is just the pine. All right, so we have this pattern, and I'm just gonna label it for my notes. In fact, I'm just gonna, can I just copy this? Let's just clone it. All right, so we have pine, we have valley, and then we have pine. Okay, so what, remember we talked about, let me just come out of this screen for a second. So remember we talked about in the lower part of the digestive system, so let's say number one, that's gonna be whatever is the oldest pollen. Whatever is highest, number three, is the newest pollen. So it looks like Otzi was around some pine, and then did he stay, just stay around pine trees and that was it? No, he was moving around because we see pine, and then we see this mixture of valley plants, and then what do we see at the top again? We see that pine again. Okay, so let's take a look. I'm gonna show you a picture. All right, 
Can you guys see this? So this is my amazing drawing of Atsu the Iceman right here. Okay. Um, and we're going to talk about what the types of pollen indicate about his pattern of movement in the last few days of his life. So we know that pine trees are able to grow in higher elevations because they can withstand the cold. So when we see in the lower part of his digestive tract, okay, when we see that he just has pine pollen and nothing else, that's an indication to us that he was at a high elevation. Okay, so I'm gonna take my little Atsi. Okay, he's at a high elevation. Um, let's say about a day and a half, uh, two days before he died, he's at a high elevation. Okay, like a day before he died, he's at a high elevation. And did he just stay up there and eventually die up there? No, he was moving, remember? And where did he move? He moved down. He moved down to the valley. How do we know he went down to the valley and that he didn't just stay up there? Because remember in the middle, we had that mix of valley plants. Okay, so he went down to the valley. Did he stay in the valley? What do you guys think? No, he went back up. Okay. And what we know about his pattern of movement. So now we know that he was high. He came down to the valley and then very quickly he went back up and we're talking um, about a high elevation here. He wasn't just walking a few feet up the mountain. He was walking about 10,000 feet up the mountain. Um, and to do this type of hiking, to kind of come all the way down, go all the way back up in a very short time period is an unusual pattern of movement. Um, I would think that you would want to rest or stay where you were. Um, so it's very interesting that he was moving like that. Um, if you know the other details of the story, um, for a long time, they didn't know how he had died. There were so many theories about it. Um, eventually, they reanalyzed or looked at some of the old scans of his body, and they found in his shoulder, they found an arrowhead. Now, how does someone get an arrowhead embedded in their shoulder? What do you guys think? It has to be shot. It has to be shot back there. So now that we know there was an arrowhead that was shot into his shoulder, he was murdered. He was killed, which adds a whole other element to this story and maybe gives some insight into this pattern of movement of kind of moving really fast over long distances. Um, one of my favorite things to do with classes when we discover this information is I love to hear everybody's version of why he would be moving like that. What do you guys think? Do you think you could maybe write a short story to come up with a reason based on the evidence that we've learned of why an individual would be moving around in that pattern? I would love to hear what you guys come up with. Uh, you could be creative. You can add as many pieces as you want to the story. Um, and you can look over other factors that relate to Otzi and you can weave them into your work. I hope you guys had fun today and hopefully I'll see you guys soon. All right. Have a wonderful day, everybody.